Hello everyone, thanks for joining us again today for our chapter book story time here at the Caribou Public Library. I'm Miss Erin and I'm so glad that you're with us again. So we are going to continue reading Black Beauty by Anna Sewell. We're in chapter 17. Um, this version is illustrated by love, Fritz Eichenberg and chapter 17 and 18 today. Um, chapter title for 17 is called Jan John Manley's Talk. So let's see what happens to Black Beauty today. The rest of our journey was very easy and a little after sunset, we reached the house of my master's friend. We were taken into a clean, snug stable. There was a kind coachman who made us very comfortable and who seemed to think a good deal of James when he heard about the fire. There is one thing quite clear, young man, he said, your horses know who they can trust. It is one of the hardest things in the world to get horses out of a stable when there's either fire or flood. Don't know why they won't come out, but they won't. Not one in 20. We stopped two or three days at this place and then returned home. All went well on the journey. We were glad to be in our own stable again, and John was equally glad to see us. Before he and James left us for the night, James said, I wonder who is coming in my place. Little Joe Green at the lodge, said John. Little Joe Green, why, he's a child. He is 14 and a half, said John, but he is such a little chap. Yes, he is small, but he is quick and willing and kind-hearted too. And then he wishes very much to come and his father would like it. And I know the master would like to give him the chance. He said, if I thought he would do the work, <clears throat> excuse me, if I thought he would not do, he would look out for a bigger boy. But I said I was quite agreeable to try him for six weeks. Six weeks, said James, why? It will be six months before he can be of much use. It will make you a deal of work, John. Well, said John with a laugh, work and I are very good friends. I never was afraid of work yet. You're a very good man, said James. I wish I may ever be like you. I don't often speak of myself, said John, but as you are going away from us out into the world to shift for yourself, I will tell you how I look on these things. I was just as old as Joseph when my father and mother died of the fever within 10 days of each other and left me and my crippled sister Nellie alone in the world without a relation that we could look to for help. I was a farmer's boy, not earning enough to keep myself, much less both of us, and she must have gone to the workhouse, but for, she would have gone to the workhouse, but for our mistress, Nellie calls her her angel, and she has good right to do so. She went and hired a room for her with old widow Mallet and she gave her knitting and needlework when she was able to do it. When she was ill, she set, sent her dinners and many nice, comfortable things and was like a mother to her. Then the master, he took me into the stable under old Norman, the, old, the coachman that was then. And I had my food at the house and my bed in the loft and a suit of clothes and three shillings a week so that I could help Nellie. Then there was Norman. He might have turned round and said, that at his age, he could not be troubled with a raw boy from the plow tail, but he was like a father to me and took no end of pains with me. When the old man died some years after, I stepped into his place. And now, of course, I have top wages, can lay by for a rainy day or a sunny day, as it may happen, and Nellie is happy as a bird. So you see, James, I am not the man that should turn up his nose at a little boy and vex a kind, good master. No, no, I shall miss you very much, James, but we shall pull through and there's nothing like doing a kindness when tis put in your way. And I'm glad I can do it. Then said James, you don't hold with that saying, everybody look after himself and take care of number one. No, indeed, said John. Where should I and Nellie have been if my master and mistress and old Norman had only taken care of number one? Why, she in the workhouse and I hoeing turnips. Where would Black Beauty and Ginger have been if you had only thought of number one? Why, roasted to death. No, Jim, no, that is a selfish, heathenish thing, thing to say. Whoever uses it and any man who thinks he has nothing to do but take care of number one, why, it's a pity but what had been drowned like a puppy or a kitten before he got his eyes open. That's what I think, said John, with a very decided jerk of his head. James laughed at this. But there was a thickness in his voice when he said, you've been my best friend, except my mother. I hope you won't forget me. No, lad, no, said John. And if ever I can do you a good turn, I hope you won't forget me. The next day, Joe came to the stables to learn all he could before James left. 
He learned to sweep the stable and bring in the straw and hay. He began to clean the harness and help to wash the carriage. And he was quite too short to do anything in the way of grooming Ginger and me. James taught him upon Merrylegs, for he was to have full charge of him under John. He was a nice little bright fellow and always came whistling to his work. Merrylegs was a good deal put out at being mauled about, as he said, by a boy who knew nothing. But towards the end of the second week, he told me confidentially that he thought the boy would turn out well. At last, the day came when James was to leave us. Cheerful as he always was, he looked quite downhearted that morning. You see, he said to John, I'm leaving a great deal behind. My mother and Betsy and you and a good master and mistress and then the horses and an old merry legs. At the new place, there will not be a soul that I shall know. If it were not that I shall get a higher place and be able to help my mother better, I don't think I should have made up my mind to do it. It is a real pinch, John. Aye, right, James, lad, so it is. But I should not think much of you if you could leave your home for the first time and not feel it. Cheer up. You'll make friends there. And if you get well on, get on well, as I'm sure you will, it will be a fine thing for your mother. And she'll be proud enough that you have got into such a good place as that. So John cheered him, cheered him up, but everyone was sorry to lose James. And as for Mary Legs, he pined after him for several days and went quite off his appetite. So John took him out several mornings with a leading rein when he exercised me and trotting and galloping by my side, got up the little fellow's spirits again and he was soon all right. Joe's father would often come in and give a little help as he understood the work and Joe took a great deal of pains to learn John was quite encouraged about him. Hmm. So a changing of the guard, right? <laughs> At the stables. Chapter 18, going for the doctor. Oh, this one has a little picture. Going for the doctor. One night, a few days after James had left, I'd eaten my hay and was laying down in my straw fast asleep. When I was suddenly roused by the stable bell ringing very loud, I heard the door of John's house open and his feet running up to the hall. He was back again in no time. <clears throat> he unlocked the stable door and came in, calling out, Wake up, beauty. You must go well now if you ever did. And almost before I could think, he had got the saddle on my back and the bridle on my head. He just ran round for his co coat, and then he took me at a quick trot up to the hall door. The squire stood there with a lamp in his hand. Now, John, he said, ride for your life. That is for your mistress's life. There is not a moment to lose. Give this note to Dr. White. Give your horse a rest at the inn and be back as soon as you can. John said, yes, sir, and was on my back in a minute. The gardener who lived at the lodge had heard the bell ringing and was ready with the gate open. And away we went through the park and through the village and down the hill until we came to the toll gate. John called very loud and thumped upon the door. The man was soon out and flung open the gate. Now, said John, do you keep the gate open for the doctor? Here's the money, and off we went again. There was long before, there was before us a long piece of level road by the riverside. John said to me, now beauty, do your best. And so I did. I wanted no whip nor spur, and for two miles I galloped as fast as I could lay my feet to the ground. I don't believe that my old grandfather, who won the race at Newmarket, could have gone faster. When we came to the bridge, John pulled me up a little and patted my neck. Well done, beauty, good old fellow, he said. He would have let me go slower, but my spirit was up and I was off again as fast as before. The air was frosty, the moon was bright. It was very pleasant. We came through a village and then through a dark wood, then uphill and downhill until after eight miles run, we came to the town, through the streets and into the marketplace. It was all quite still, except the clatter of my feet on the stones. Everybody was asleep. Mm, here we are. Picture of them going through town with nothing else happening because it's the middle of the night. The church clock struck three as we drew up at Dr. White's door. John rang the bell twice and then knocked at the door like thunder. A window was thrown up and Dr. White, in his nightcap, put his head out and said, What do you want? Mrs. Gordon is very ill, sir. Master wants you to come out at once. He thinks she will die if you cannot get there. Here is a note. Wait, he said, I will come. He shut the window and was soon at the door. The worst of it is, he said, that my horse has been out all day and is quite done up. My son has just been sent for and he has taken the other. 
What is it to be done? Can I have your horse? He's come at a gallop nearly all the way, sir, and I was to give him a rest here. But I think my master would not be against it if you think fit, sir. All right, he said. I'll soon be ready. John stood by me and stroked my neck. I was very hot. The doctor came out with his riding whip. You need not take that, sir, said John. Black Beauty will go till he drops. Take care of him, sir. If you can, I should not like any harm to come to him. No, no, John, said the doctor. I hope not. And in a minute, we had left John far behind. I will not tell you about our way back. The doctor was a heavier man than John and not so good a rider. However, I did my best. The man at the toll gate had it open. When we came to the hill, the doctor drew me up. Now, my good fellow, he said, take some breath. I was glad he did, for I was nearly spent. But that breathing helped me on, and soon we were in the park. Joe was at the lodge gate. My master was at the hall door, for he had heard us coming. He spoke not a word. The doctor went into the house with him, and Joe led me to the stable. I was glad to get home. My legs shook under me, and I could only stand and pant. I had not a dry hair on my body. The water ran down my legs, and I steamed all over. Joe used to say, like a pot on the fire. Poor Joe. He was young and small, and as yet he knew very little and his father, who would have helped him, had been sent to the next village. But I'm sure he did the very best he knew. He rubbed my legs and my chest, but he did not put my warm cloth on me. He thought I was so hot I should not like it. Then he gave me a pail full of water to drink. It was cold and very good, and I drank it all. Then he gave me some hay and some corn, and thinking he had done right, he went away. I soon began to shake and tremble and turn deadly cold. My legs ached, my loins ached, and my chest ached, and I felt sore all over. Oh, how I wished for my warm, thick cloth as I stood and trembled. I wished for John, but he had eight miles to walk, and so I lay down in my straw and tried to go to sleep. After a long while, I heard John at the door. I gave a low moan, for I was in great pain. He was at my side in a moment, stooping down by me. I could not tell him how I felt, but he seemed to know it all. He covered me up with two or three warm cloths and then ran to the house for some hot water. He made me some warm gruel, which I drank, and then I think I went to sleep. John seemed to be very much put out. I heard him say to himself over and over again, oh, stupid boy, stupid boy, no cloth put on, and I dare say the water was too cold. Boys are no good. But Joe was a good boy after all. I was now very ill. A strong inflammation had attacked my lungs, and I could not draw my breath without pain. John nursed me night and day. He would get up two or three times in the night to come to me. My master, too, often came to see me. My poor beauty, he said one day. My good horse, you saved your mistress's life, beauty. Yes, you saved her life. I was very glad to hear that. For it seems the doctor had said that if we had been a little longer, it would have been too late. John told my master he never saw a horse go so fast in his life. It seemed as if the horse knew what was the matter. Of course I did, though John thought not. At least I knew as much as this, that John and I must go at the top of our speed and that it was for the sake of the mistress. So she survived, but Black Beauty is very sick. We'll have to read next time, chapter 19. All right, we'll see you then. Have a wonderful rest of your day.